Taking on the Fake News Part 3. She excited? I mean, I love taking on fake news. Don't you just feel that? I, you know, as we go through some of these crises in our culture, you just want to do something about it. You want to stand up and speak. You want your voice to be heard. And yet our voice feels very small, doesn't it? The devil's like, shut up. You don't have anything to say. Well, let's take on the fake news. You know how we do it? By believing the word of God. By believing the truth. This is how we do it. So let's continue in this. Our session three, this is going to be a, a very simple one, and I, and I hope you can just sort of soak in it. It's 10 easy to memorize proofs. Okay, so I'm just actually going to read through these proofs. And these are the, what I've oftentimes called 10 simple proofs that even a child can understand. I would highly encourage each of you to actually memorize these. In the upcoming weeks, if you go through this series and next week's series, you're going to get these proofs in a great, greater detail where I'm going to go into each one. But if you could memorize these, then when you encounter someone that just needs that encouragement, and that someone could be you, by the way, where you can just rehearse these and just remind yourself of this supernatural book that is put together by God. Okay? So let's go through this. Proof number one. It is supernaturally built. Uh, now, I, again, I'm going to try and refrain myself from commenting uh, significantly on each of these. But when you study the history of the Word of God, there is no explanation for this book. It is not crafted by just a good author and by a, good, uh, by a collection of people, you know, that are going to be like, okay, uh, let's get together. We have some manuscripts here. How can we put them together into something known as the Bible? This book is built by God to reveal God. There is no explanation other than that. It is supernaturally built. Proof number two, it performs what it promises over and over and over again. It says and it does. It says and it does. And you can prove this in your own life, guys. Just start believing it. Follow what it says and you will see that it will perform precisely what it promises. Proof number three, God himself declares it to be a supernatural revelation. Well, that should be pretty good for us. If we believe the book to be God's book in the first place, then let him talk about his own book. What does he say? He says it's divine. He says it's from him. He says he gave it. He says he carried along the writers to write it. So as a result, we recognize it is a supernatural revelation, even according to God himself. It's not just my opinion. It's his. Proof number four. Though strong empires have sought to destroy it, no one has been able to stamp it out. Did you know that entire nations, empires, have set out to destroy this book? You know, the nation I'm living in right now, America, sort of seems to be hell-bent on doing a similar thing. Why is this book so threatening? Isn't that a funny thought? Well, what does it talk about? It talks about love and mercy and justice and kindness and peace and joy. I'm trying to think, why would someone want to eradicate this? Well, because it exposes sin. It exposes the weakness of the devil. It exposes the fact that he's a fraud. It exposes the fact that he's, he's defeated and his head is crushed. It exposes the fact that there is a king over all that must be submitted to. Well, it does. It exposes us as sinners and him as the Savior. If you don't want to hear that, I guess you would want to get rid of the book. But those strong empires have sought to destroy this book. No one has been able to stamp it out. Isn't that amazing? It's just a book. How can a book defend itself? And yet you try and take on this book and you die. Isn't that amazing? You try and stamp it out and you're the one that gets stamped out. That's an irony. That's a strange book. How does a book do that? I thought it was just an inanimate object. Well, this book has a caretaker and his name is God Almighty. Proof number five. It has been better preserved than any book in history, easily provable uh, out throughout history. The manuscript evidence on this is astounding compared to every great work of historic literature where there's just small samplings. And yet you don't question if uh, Homer's Iliad and Odyssey is accurate in its translation. You don't sit there and parse the words and go, I doubt that that's true. I doubt that that's what Homer uh, wrote. And yet we do that to the Bible all the time, and yet we have far more manuscript evidence for the Bible than any other historic piece of literature. I mean, you could probably stack all of the manuscript evidence for all of the historic pieces of literature and still fall short of what we have for the Bible. It has been better preserved than any book in history. Proof number six, it is astoundingly accurate in its histories and accounts. The Bible doesn't present itself just as a history book, and yet it is 
perfectly accurate in its histories. I mean, profoundly so. More so than any other historic uh, annal. This book is just true in every regard. What it says is right. What it says is true. Proof number seven, it's too honest to be human. <laughs> this is a really fascinating one to ever meditate upon, but it actually shows the weakness is of its heroes. It demonstrates this people group that God is going to set apart and it's going to allow their weaknesses to be shown. What book written by a people group that wants to showcase its amazing qualities as a nation, Israel, is going to allow its greatest heroes to be on display in all their weakness? It's actually too honest to be human. That's one of the amazing attributes of this book. Almost every other great historic work that is going to be the history of a nation is going to be sponsored by the monarch himself, the king. He says, oh, could you write this about me and make me look really good? And the Bible is going to come in and do the exact opposite, which why throughout history, it's why we use this phrase. It's too honest to be human. Proof number eight, the power of darkness stands virulently against this book. You know that that's actually an evidence. It's a proof to our soul. You see, the devil doesn't stand against Homer's Iliad. It doesn't care about Homer's Iliad, but it does care about the Bible. Why? It's just a book, right? Why is the enemy so hell-bent on destroying this book? Why is he so against these words? Well, because they're God's words. So it's a dead giveaway. The devil's giving away his own position in having such hostility towards it. Proof number nine. Simply put, this book changes lives. When people come to this book, their life alters. When they come to the God of this book, the message of this book, they change dramatically. The greatest criminals in a society have become the greatest saints in a society. How does that happen? Because no prison system has ever been able to reform a criminal like that. But this book, you see, this book isn't just a book. It is living. It introduces us to a living God who in a very living way engages with the soul of those that are reading and those that are believing and those that are heeding this word. As a result, it shows the supernatural nature of it. This is God's word. It changes lives. Proof number 10. Men and women throughout history have gladly died to preserve its every jot and tittle. So every jot and tittle, that's a Hebrew concept for the Hebrew language where you have jots and tittles. It's sort of like we have dots to I's and crosses to T's. Every little mark matters. And people have died to preserve every little dot and tittle. Why would they do that? Why would they do that if it wasn't God's word? You see, the amount of convincing that takes place to get someone to die is pretty extreme. And you take Jesus' disciples turned apostles and every single one of them is willing to lay down their life. In fact, out of the 12, 11 of them are actually going to die because of martyrdom. The 12th, John, the apostle, is actually going to be thrown into a vat of boiling oil. And since he, nothing's happened to him, they pull him out and he's still unscathed. Not a hair on his body was even singed. Okay, that's weird. right? But every single one of them was willing to be killed for the integrity of the message that they were carrying. What, what message were they carrying? The message of this book. They were carrying the message of the gospel. And they believed it to be true. They believed this book to actually herald the realities of another realm. And they were right, I believe. And I'm going to throw in a bonus proof that you can throw in too if you're ever sharing this with someone. I think it's a rather compelling one. I don't stick it in the top 10 because it's subjective. It's my own perspective. See, all those other ones are things you can observe in history. They're things you can observe in the text itself. Listen to this. Bonus proof number 11. I have personally been changed by this book. I'm a different man because of it. When I believe what this book says, it has transformed my life. I love people that are very unlovely. I love people that hate me, that would spit upon me. If they had the chance, they would kill me. And yet, strangely, I love them. What is this? Well, I am told about this in this book. I am told that if I come to the God that this book points to, this Jesus who died on the cross for me, that this reality would actually enter into my life and transform me and that I would be known as one of his disciples because of this thing called love. First of all, love for one another in the body of Christ and then love for a lost and dying world. The same love he has will actually be shed abroad in my heart. That's what the book says. And guess what? That's what I've seen in my own life. 
This book is supernatural. This book is truth.